As Sister Jamila lights her candle, she whispers a prayer passed down to her through over 40 generations of her family. The rising smoke carries her prayer high into the heavens. She is a member of the original Christian church, started almost 2,000 years ago. But what happened to this original church, and where do we find it? At that time, those believers in Jesus Christ joined together with the apostles, establishing the first organized church community in the city of Antioch. It is there in Antioch that they were first called Christians, as stated in Acts 11.25. Scholars estimate there are over 2,600 groups today who lay claim to being the church, or at least the direct descendant of the church described in the New Testament. As Christianity has inarguably played a considerable role in our history, it is important to understand the factors which have led to its current divided state. <laughs> With the birth of the Church of Jesus Christ at Pentecost, the apostles made many missionary journeys. Over time, five patriarchates were established in Antioch, Jerusalem, Rome, Alexandria, and Constantinople. The apostle Peter was the first bishop of Antioch. Twelve years later, he became the first bishop of Rome leaving the Apostle Paul as the head of the Antiochian Church, while James, the brother of Jesus, was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Even though they were in full communion with one another, disputes arose over the adherence to the Old Testament law. James gave the solution to settle all doctrinal and moral issues through ecumenical councils, and the Church flourished for 1,054 years. The first council was known as the Council of Jerusalem, as documented in Acts 15. In the history of the Christian Church, we find scores of such councils, establishing its canon laws, which the Orthodox regard as the faith of the Apostles, faith of the Fathers, faith of the Orthodox, the faith which has established the universe. Heresies, disputes, numerous wars, and much persecution constantly challenged the early fathers of Orthodox Christians. But because the Church was unified, it continued to survive. At the Ecumenical Council in 325 at Nicaea, the bishops decided they needed a creed. After much prayer, and some 90 years, what's known today as the Nicene Creed was finally written. Between the years 325 and 787, seven meetings were held to establish the laws of the Church. These became known as the Seven Ecumenical Councils. The faith of the Church at the close of its first thousand years was the same. The doctrine, the creed, the government were all recognized as one everywhere. This one Church was the Orthodox Church which has weathered many attacks. This cohesion, however, was soon to end. As the first millennium was drawing to a close, tensions began to mount between the Western Church, Rome, and the four Eastern Churches. 
the bishops of Rome began to claim authority over the other four churches. On the claim that the Roman patriarch was the only true successor of Peter, two giant issues emerged. First, Rome's declaration of the Pope's supremacy, and second, that the wording of the 700-year-old creed be changed. As disunity led to conflict, a cardinal was sent by the Roman bishop to slap a document on the altar of the church in Constantinople during a Sunday worship, excommunicating the Patriarch of Constantinople from the church. The final consequences of these tragic events was a massive split. The Great Schism occurred in the year 1054. Pursuing his claim of a universal headship of the church, the Patriarch of Rome broke from the other four churches, creating the Roman Catholic Church, independent of the other four. Meanwhile, the four Eastern or Orthodox patriarchs continued to carry on. In 1517, a little-known German monk named Martin Luther, protesting certain Roman Catholic practices, nailed a 95-point thesis to the door of the Roman Church in Wittenberg. His critique started what is now known as the Protestant Reformation. Fueled by complex political, social, and economic factors, in addition to religious problems, the Reformation spread like a raging fire into virtually every nook and cranny of the Roman Catholic Church. As decade followed decade, many branches of Protestantism took various forms. Different divisions insisted they were neither Protestant nor Catholic, most wanting a less centralized form of leadership. Anyone could start their own church, which led to today's 2,600 different Protestant denominations. While many profess to being Christians, they reject the biblical data which speak of the historic church, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Some pretended to be the New Testament church, but were seriously off base, leading many people far astray from Christ and the church. But that first church of the apostles, despite persecution, political oppression, and desertion, miraculously carried on. Today, the four patriarchates remain intact, in full communion, maintaining the original apostolic faith of the New Testament record. The holiest two Christian shrines, the Nativity, where Jesus was born, and the Sepulchre, where Jesus was buried and resurrected, are still protected to this day by the Orthodox Church. As the 165th direct successor to the Apostle Peter, the Patriarch of Antioch, Ignatius IV, presides on a street called Strait, as is mentioned in the Bible. Patriarch Ignatius IV took his name after the great martyr Ignatius I, who was the third to preside on the throne of Antioch from 67 to 107 AD. Records of Orthodox tradition hold that Ignatius of Antioch was the young child Christ took up into his arms in Matthew 18.3. We did not invent orthodoxy. Churches cannot be invented. Uh, and, and nobody can make a church. And Christ is the only one who spoke about his own church. And we believe that we stick to orthodoxy because it is his own church. Today, the Patriarchate of Antioch, together with the three other ancient Eastern Patriarchates, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Jerusalem added five modern patriarchates, Russia, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Georgia, four autocephalous churches, Cyprus, Greece, Poland, and Albania, and five autonomous churches, Sinai, Czech Republic, Finland, Japan, and China. Many with dependent bodies throughout the world, together they comprise what is known as the Eastern Orthodox Church, with an estimated 250 million adherents, of whom some five to six million live in the United States and Canada. According to Mr. Daly Smith of Southern Baptist Ministries, people are leaving church feeling empty on Sundays, 
they are not being lifted spiritually. Similar reports come from Europe and South America, where church members are simply dropping out. My parents raised me Baptist, and it, it wasn't ever really doing it for me. Uh, I, they used to make me go to church every Sunday, and now I just kind of don't believe in anything. I uh, take what I want to out of the Bible and out of the Word, and I pray on my own, and I just don't really feel that I need one man, a pastor, or a priest to, to, to give me that Word. I think it's my relationship with God and my relationship with Christ, and you know, no man, I feel, has one word to say about it. We don't go to church on Sunday to listen to a lecture or a sermon. We go to church to be sanctified to experience this holiness, which is in the Divine Liturgy. And uh, if you go to church and uh, don't experience uh, this sense of the holy, uh, then you leave the church without, uh, without what uh, the American uh, uh, psychologist William, William James said, uh, without a, a spiritual experience. And we go to church to have a spiritual experience and be in communion, uh, not only with God, but with each other. Orthodox service is a celebration. A few have discovered the original church and are converting to orthodoxy. In 1987, about 20 parishes of former evangelicals embraced the Orthodox faith. I uh, chrismated them and uh, ordained them. Uh, and they are an integral and very important part of the uh, Archdiocese today. The thing that <clears throat> brought us to uh, at least look at the church was after almost a decade of campus outreach and evangelism in the 60s, we became convinced that biblically we had to be tied into the church to do what we were doing. Uh, we did not set out to discover orthodoxy. We set out to find out what the ancient church was really like. And in doing so, we discovered orthodoxy. All you orthodox Christians, may the Lord God remember his heavenly kingdom, always now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. From the beginning, the breaking of the bread and wine was kept at the very center of Christian worship. The uniqueness of orthodoxy and how it differs from uh, Protestantism is this, that we do not through the Divine Liturgy, we do not tell people uh, what Christ said only. Through the sacrament, which we call communion or the Eucharist, Eucharistia, uh, we tell people what Christ indeed did. Just as the law, the Psalms, and the prophets were read in the synagogue worship in early Israel, so the church also gave high priority to the public reading of scripture and to preaching. Baptism, anointing with oil, marriage, healing, confession, and ordination to minister the gospel remain unchanged from the early Christian church. Orthodox Christians believe in a grace and a power from God given to them through each of these occasions. The church sees these events as holy moments in her life and calls them her mysteries. With an Orthodox service, you don't really have the sense of, oh, it was a good service today, it was, it was a bad service this week, because the focus of the service is on the liturgy. To discover that there was liturgy in the ancient church came as a horrendous shock. To find out that there was liturgy in that Bible that I thought I knew so well was frightening. And I began to ask, what else is there in there that I don't understand? I began in, to run into the word in the Bible, the word Eucharist. Oh, we don't usually translate it that way in the English Bible. We just translate it the giving of thanks or giving thanks. But the word was there. The very word that we took into the English language as Eucharist was right there in the Bible. As in years gone by, the basics of Christian doctrine, worship, and government are never up for negotiation. It simply has not left its course. Over 2,000 years later, it is still one. Because of the Orthodox Church records of marriages and baptisms, my family was able to trace our name through the Bible as descendants of Zacchaeus, the tax collector whom Jesus had dinner with. 
I am... Uh, I feel like I'm living proof of its authenticity. In fact, we had in my immediate ancestry 17 generations of Orthodox bishops. We're here. If you want to come, come. Because we're always here, we've always been here, we always will be here. And that's assur assuring. Most people that I talk to who have become Orthodox, it's because it's always there. The tradition is always there. It's always the same. Being an Orthodox Christian, I celebrate being a member of the family of God. We know we are sinners. We have broken every contract God has offered us. But at the same time, I am most grateful for that loophole of salvation that God gave us through Christ. That's what it's all about. Christianity is for now and for tomorrow and for every day. Jesus' ministry lasted three years. Yet, with the new millennium, it is the world's largest ministry with some two billion followers. Out with the old, a tooth for a tooth, and in with a new and difficult way of life, turn the other cheek. The meek will be exalted. Love your enemy and give the shivering man your cloak. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. It's a religion of love, a religion of mercy, a religion of compassion. Uh, it's not a judgmental religion. And any theology which does not touch people in their pain and suffering is a remote theology. It has nothing to do with people. After 2,000 years, we have not forgotten the short but dramatic life of Jesus of Nazareth and the powerful message he left behind. The challenge, the aspiration. He encourages man to do better, to be charitable, to forgive. He talks of faith, hope, and love. The Orthodox Church will continue in that challenge until his return. That challenge is to spread the good news about the historic church, the one that Christ himself established, being sure it is identical to the Church of the Apostles. America needs the Orthodox faith. I said to the Evangelical Orthodox in the past Sundays, I said, welcome home. The day I say to America, come home, America. Come home to the faith of Peter and Paul. The doors of Orthodoxy are open wide, and the invitation is extended to come and see. Examine her faith her worship, her history, her commitment to Christ, her love for God the Father, her communion with the Holy Spirit, her mystery. She has kept the faith delivered to the saints. In her walls is the fullness of the salvation which was realized when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.